Well, thanks very much for the introduction, Gail. So I'm Dr. Benson Chen. I'm a neurologist and a neuro-ophthalmologist, uh, which basically means I'm a brain doctor, but I also work with eye diseases uh, that are due to neurological things. Um, and so, you know, thank you very much to the panel for inviting me to give a presentation on gene therapy. And so our research group uh, under Professor Patrick Uyman, who's the professor of ophthalmology uh, here at the university, we're very interested in a group of patients with a rare condition uh, called labor hereditary optic neuropathy, which is a mitochondrial disorder. Um, and so the talk this afternoon will essentially, um, you know, share with you some of the background information about gene therapy and how gene therapy works, but we'll also talk specifically about development of gene therapy for mitochondrial diseases. Uh, and some of the controversies uh, in the treatments that are being developed. And so there'll be plenty of uh, interesting things to cover and hopefully some controversial things to, uh, to sort of discuss as well at the end in the Q&A. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just bring up my talk and then we'll get into it. Um, and if at any point uh, during the talk, if you know, if you want any further clarification, um, please do stop me. But I've tried to make this presentation uh, a fairly sort of understandable level for most people, even if you don't have a lot of background information in genetics uh, or gene therapy. So for the next 40 minutes, we'll talk a little bit about mitochondrial biology and what is the mitochondria and how it works. We'll have a think about the basics of gene therapy um, and then focus on gene therapy in labor hereditary optic neuropathy or LON. And then finally, we'll end on some other approaches to gene therapy for mitochondrial disease. So here we go, the first section. So I guess the first thing to point out is that although we understand, you know, everyone has DNA uh, and DNA essentially is the uh, genetic instructions that uh, tells, you know, that determines what what features someone has, so, you know, eye color, hair color, and things like that. Uh, we also do have another set of DNA called the mitochondrial DNA. Uh, and unlike the nuclear DNA, where you inherit, you know, half your genes from your mother and half your genes from your father, uh, with mitochondrial DNA, you only inherit mitochondrial DNA from your mother. So mitochondrial DNA is transmitted along the maternal lineage, like you can see here. So this man here has inherited his mitochondria from his mother, who has inherited her mitochondria from her mother uh, and from her mother as well. So what is the mitochondria? Where does the mitochondrial DNA live? And what about nuclear DNA or the DNA that generally you and I would understand to be DNA? So the two areas where our DNA live are firstly in the nucleus of the cell. So every, every part of the body is made up of cells and in the middle of the cell is a organelle called the nucleus and our nuclear DNA lives in here. And so in each cell, uh, there's one nucleus, which contains nuclear DNA, consisting of 23 pairs of chromosomes. And the 23 pairs of chromosomes consist of approximately 3 billion base pairs, uh, and they code for more than 20,000 different genes. Whereas the mitochondria, the sort of uh, sausage kidney shaped structure inside the, uh, inside the cell, each cell can have tens to hundreds of mitochondria. And then within each mitochondria, there can be uh, thousands of copies of mitochondrial DNA. And interestingly, compared to the nuclear DNA, mitochondrial DNA only encodes for 37 genes. So what do the mitochondria look like and what do they actually do? So this is a picture of, uh, of some mitochondria taken by scanning electron microscope. Uh, and we can see here that mitochondria come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, and they all exist in different kinds of cells. So here we've got an example of uh, a mitochondria from a heart muscle cell or a cardiomyocyte. Uh, and here we can see the mitochondria from the adrenal gland. And so the general shape is usually a sausage shape quite, uh, type thing, or even a circular shape type thing with these little folds or what we call cristae inside the mitochondria. So we know that mitochondria have cell dependent phenotypes. So what this means is that the volume or the density of mitochondria within each cell varies depending on what kind of cell it is. 
So cells that require lots of energy, for example, you know, neurons, so uh, brain cells, or even cells in the back of the eyes, the retinal ganglion cells that are really important for vision, will contain a lot of mitochondria. Uh, and similarly, muscle cells will also contain lots of mitochondria as well. Whereas other cells, such as bone, which doesn't have a high turnover or need as much energy, may not require as much density of mitochondria compared to other cells. Similarly, the number of copies of DNA within the mitochondria also vary, and the metabolism of the mitochondria is also dependent on the cellular oxygen consumption. So this relates to how energetic that cell is, because the mitochondria have a critical role in producing energy for the cell. So what are the features of the mitochondria? So mitochondria contain DNA, which are circular shaped structures. And we'll have a look at uh, what the DNA of a mitochondria looks like in the next couple of slides. But mitochondria also contain some lipids, some fats. They also contain some special chemicals, which are important for producing energy. There's also protein complexes embedded within the mitochondria. And like I was saying before, the mitochondria can also have different shapes, sizes, and complexity, depending on what cell type it belongs to. So in terms of the functions and activities of mitochondria, the most critical are the ones that relate to uh, producing energy uh, through a process called oxidative phosphorylation, which we'll have a look at uh, in a second. And that involves a process uh, called uh, electron transport chain uh, or ele electron uh, transport or, resp uh, or cellular respiration. Uh, and not only that, the mitochondria also have critical functions in maintaining certain types of elements within the cell. So for example, calcium. Uh, and that's also really important for things like programming of cell death. So if the cell becomes injured and the mitochondria isn't able to sustain the cell, then sometimes the mitochondria is able to access a kill pathway that essentially kills or shuts down the cell to conserve energy uh, for the tissue. Lastly, uh, how does the mitochondria do all of those sorts of functions? It can behave in certain ways through a process called fission or fusion, where different mitochondria can join together uh, to form one longer one called fusion, or it can split up. For example, if the cell requires a lot more energy, the mitochondria can essentially split up and uh, undergo a fission process to produce more mitochondria. The mitochondria, they don't just float around inside the cell, they're capable of moving in different directions. And they've also got very important roles for communicating between the mitochondria and also with other components or organelles within the cell. And we'll have a focus on these two, uh, sorry, the functions and activities on the next slide. So I mentioned oxidative, uh, oxidative phosphorylation or OxFos. The role of OxFos is essentially to produce ATP, which is the energy that's used by all cells in the body in order to carry out their functions. So one of the analogies that we often use in medicine is that the mitochondria are essentially like battery packs or batteries, and they produce the energy that the cells uh, require in order to operate. So the way that it does that is through the process of OxFos, which can, uh, consists of two components, the electron transport chain, which involves uh, passing an electron through different proteins to generate a certain current or generate a different membrane potential between the inside uh, of the mitochondria and the area in between these two membranes called the uh, intermembrane region. Uh, and by generating this uh, potential difference, we can then use uh, chemiosmosis to essentially produce ATP from ADP. So this process requires oxygen. And if this process fails, either because some of these proteins that form part of the electron transport chain aren't running efficiently, or the uh, membrane potential isn't generated properly, this can potentially lead to failure of production of ATP. And as a result of this, it leads to dysfunction and uh, the development of mitochondrial syndromes. So if we remember this picture here of all the mitochondria in the different cells, essentially the mitochondria that become dysfunctional, uh, this, sorry, the cell type determines uh, what kind of dysfunction we might see clinically from a medical perspective. And so as you can imagine, 
mitochondrial dysfunction can lead to a number of issues. And it mainly tends to affect cells that require a lot of energy. So here we can see in this uh, cartoon that we've divided symptoms of mitochondrial dysfunction into neurological as well as non-neurological. And so you can imagine, you know, the kidneys, the liver, the heart, the lungs, the intestines all require a lot of energy to function. And so if you have failure of the mitochondria, uh, potentially this can lead to issues uh, with symptoms involving these organs. And similarly, with neurological uh, manifestations of mitochondrial disease, if it affects the muscle, the muscle will fail. And people with mitochondrial disease involving the muscle can develop muscle weakness as well as exercise intolerance. And if there's mitochondrial dysfunction involving the brain, it can lead to a variety of neurological symptoms, such as migraine, dementia, seizures, or even mood or psychiatric symptoms. In the eye clinic, we see a lot of patients with optic atrophy. So this is a condition where you get damage to the retinal ganglion cells. And we've got a couple of slides to show you about that, uh, where essentially the cable that connects the eyeball to the brain fails as a result of mitochondrial dysfunction and people can develop vision loss. So here's a little cartoon demonstrating the two types of DNA again. We've got nuclear DNA, so the pairs of chromosomes, as well as mitochondrial DNA, which is a ring-shaped structure of which there are thousands of copies within each mitochondrion. And so in the circular shape mitochondria, we've got two chains. We've got a light chain, which is the smaller one in the middle, and a heavy chain, which is the thicker one on the outside. And as I said before, the mitochondria uh, DNA only codes for 37 genes. 13 of those are genes that are involved uh, in the production of proteins that form the different complexes of the electron transport chain. And the remaining genes are ones that code for tRNA and RNA, which I'm not going to cover today. The other curious thing that we know about mitochondrial disease is because we've got multiple mitochondria with multiple copies of the DNA within the mitochondria, sometimes patients who have mitochondrial mutations don't always have symptoms of their disease. And that might be because of two reasons. The first is that mitochondrial mutations exhibit heteroplasmy. So what this basically means is that depending on the amount of mutant mitochondria or mutated mitochondria, uh, the cell that the mitochondria are supplying may continue to work even though there is a low mutant load. Whereas the other thing that we also need to consider is the fact that for some cells, which are very energetic and require a lot of energy, they may be more susceptible to mitochondrial mutations, even at a very low mutant load level. So it's generally understood that you need at least 80% mutant load in order for a cell to start to fail. But obviously, we also need to consider the fact that some tissues, such as neurons, or the retinal ganglion cells in the back of the eyes are much more metabolically active tissue and are therefore at greater risk of bioenergetic impairment, even at a lower mutant load level. So that was the first thing talking about mitochondrial uh, biology. Let's now go on to think about the basics of gene therapy and how we can treat genetic disorders, in particular mitochondrial disorders. So the first thing that we need to understand is, well, what are the genes doing and how do the genes produce proteins and how do these proteins then lead on to disease? So as I said at the start of the talk, DNA essentially are the instructions uh, that tell our cells how to produce certain proteins. And the proteins can come in all different shapes and forms and they all uh, they will join together like pieces of a Tetris puzzle and have different functions that allow the cell and the tissue to have certain actions. So the DNA that we're seeing here is nuclear DNA, which is found inside the nucleus. And here we can see the coding or the alphabet or these individual bases or base pairs uh, that are telling the cell how to produce the certain protein. So when we trans, uh, transcribe and then translate the gene into a protein, uh, there are several steps that are required. The first step is to unravel the DNA 
and then produce a template called a pre-messenger RNA, which essentially is like a ticker tape with instructions that tells the ribosomes, the circular shaped structure here, how to produce the protein. And so on the ticker tape, we can see all these different individual letters, C, A, G, and T as well. And these are the letters that essentially tell the cell, uh, tell the ribosomes what proteins to link together. And the way that the ribosome works is instead of reading each individual letter on its own, the ribosome reads things in triplets or what we call codons. And with each codon, there is a code here that you can see on the bottom of the screen that tells the cell or tells the ribosome and the tRNA which protein that it needs to join together. And so here we can see that with each triplet, the corresponding amino acids, so all these different three letter things here, uh, leucine, proline, serine, and things like that, are all individual proteins that then join together to form a chain. And then depending on the sequence of those amino acids or proteins, the final protein will have a certain configuration or structure. And it's having the important structure of the protein that's vital for the cell to produce a certain function. So if, for example, we changed this base from a U into a G, so now it's turned red, it means that our instructions that we're telling the cell what to do will change completely. Because here on the mRNA, the instructions on that ticker tape changes. And on that ticker tape, as it goes to the ribosome, here, as it's being fed through the ribosome, the protein that it's going to match up with is no longer the one that it was going to originally match up with. And as a result, the amino acid uh, that was blue has now changed into purple. And the subsequent protein here may not have the same structure or form because the amino acid has changed. So this can potentially lead to disease, but there's lots of uh, ways that the DNA system and the transcription translation system works to override and to account for some of these errors that can naturally occur uh, on their own spontaneously, but don't necessarily cause disease. But I think for the purposes of this talk, if you think about alterations in DNA leading to alterations in the amino acid structure uh, and the protein structure uh, leading to disease, this is how we can think about how to approach genetic therapy or gene therapy. So if we were to think about how we can uh, repair or uh, overcome some of these challenges, the first thing that we can do theoretically would be to replace the faulty gene with a healthy copy. So never mind this individual change. If we can find the entire gene and insert a healthy copy into the nucleus so that the instructions, the original instructions are being sent to the ribosome, then potentially we will produce the, 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 the original protein without any fault. Or another way that we could theoretically fix it would be, well, if we know that this is the mutated one, why don't we use some sort of technique that allows us to swap over this faulty uh, nucleotide or faulty base? Or we could consider chopping out that faulty section. But then if you chop out the faulty section, then potentially the, uh, the, the cell may not produce that protein. But for some disorders where the faulty protein becomes toxic, it might be better to delete that gene entirely, either by chopping it out or removing it entirely so that uh, you don't get what we call a dominant negative effect or a toxic gain of function effect. The other approaches to gene therapy that we can think of theoretically are, well, if we can't correct the gene at uh, within, within the nucleus, why don't we stop it from being translated? So potentially if we block off the area where it's going to be fed into the ribosome, we can get the ribosome to ignore that codon so that section is skipped. Or we could even stop the ribosome from producing that mRNA, or uh, uh, sorry, from translating that mRNA altogether by halting the process of translation. And all these different things here, which I pointed out in these little blue boxes, are actually techniques that we're currently using to treat genetic disorders. So the most common approach to gene therapy is using this technique of a viral vector-based gene therapy. So what does that mean and why are we introducing viruses? So one curious thing that we've observed is that the way that viruses infect the human body. So, you know, if you get if you get an influenza in the winter or if you get 
even just a common viral cold in winter, what's the virus doing in the cell? Essentially, when a virus infects a cell, it attaches itself to the cell, it then enters the cell, it then forces its DNA into the nucleus of the cell and forces the nucleus to produce the viral DNA. The viral DNA is then packaged together to form new viruses. And then once critical limit is reached, the cell bursts open and releases all the new viruses that have been produced by the virus, basically uh, taking over the function of the nucleus. And so we can use this technique to essentially introduce genes, healthy genes, into the cells that we want to infect. And so this is a technique that we call gene therapy using an adenovirus vector, or an AAV, or adeno-associated virus. So in this situation here, if we know that there are certain viruses that are able to harness the machinery of the cell and essentially take over the function of the nucleus to produce its own DNA, we can essentially take you know, these viruses and the most common one that doesn't cause disease is called an adenovirus. We can genetically modify it by removing the virus's DNA and and essentially package up the virus with a new gene, the gene that we want to introduce into the cell that's been affected by the genetic disorder. And then we can then inject the virus into the tissue that's being, uh, that we want to infect. And then the virus will then, following this diagram here on the left, will then enter the cell, inject the new DNA into the nucleus so that the nucleus of the cell will then produce the DNA uh, that you want uh, and depending on where that gene is going to be located, uh, the gene then after it's produced will then go on uh, to function the way that it is supposed to normally function. Um, and because we've removed the infectious part of the virus, essentially you won't have this phenomenon where the cell will burst open and die because new viruses are being produced. So. What do we need in order to have gene therapy? The first is to understand we've, we've, we, we must know exactly what the genetic mutation is that's causing the disorder. And the disease should be a monogenic disorder. So therefore a single mutation or a single gene, sorry, a single gene causing the disorder. Uh, because if the disorder is caused by multiple genes, it would be very difficult to develop a gene therapy. The second is that the gene that we want to introduce must be small enough to fit inside the viral vector, because if it's too big, we can't package it inside the virus, and therefore we've got no way of getting the virus to introduce the gene. The other thing we need to consider is that we have to get the virus to, uh, we have to deliver, sorry, the virus to the affected cells without the immune system destroying the virus. So there's probably no point trying to introduce gene therapy by injecting it into the bloodstream, because if we inject it into the bloodstream, the immune system will recognize the virus as being foreign and your immune system will go into overdrive to destroy the virus. So therefore, if we want to deliver gene therapy, we'll have to be able to inject it or infuse it into the tissue uh, of interest. So for example, if it's a problem with uh, a, a, a genetic mutation that affects the retina or the photoreceptors of the retina at the back of the eyes, then you can imagine the best way to deliver that would be to inject something into the eye. And likewise, if it was a disorder affecting the liver, potentially injecting it into the liver would be an option there as well. The other approach to this would be, well, you know, for example, with some blood disorders, we can potentially harvest the cells that we want to correct correct it outside the body once we've harvested the cells and then inject the cells back into the body again. Uh, but that takes um, multiple steps and sometimes is a lot more difficult to complete uh, than conventional viral vector-based gene therapy. The other thing we need to also consider is that the virus has to infect the affected cell and it's got to be able to transfer the nucleic acid into that cell nucleus because if it doesn't enter the cell or it doesn't enter the nucleus then there's no way the nucleus will produce that DNA that we want to uh, introduce. And finally the effect must be durable. So you know, if the effect is great after one injection, we want to make sure that that effect is durable because multiple injections can potentially lead to issues uh, with uh, 
um, the immune system, um, immune system attacking those cells. So I mentioned infusion before. Infusion essentially means injecting something via the bloodstream, so either through a liquid or, uh, well, essentially through a liquid. So having, say, a cannula, a plastic tube or cannula stuck into a peripheral vein and then flushing that vein with a liquid containing the virus. So an infusion isn't effective because the immune system essentially will attack the virus that's in the liquid before it even reaches the target site. Okay, so we've talked about gene therapy in general. What about gene therapy for mitochondrial disease? So let's focus a little bit about LHON or labor hereditary optic neuropathy. So this is a mitochondrial genetic disorder due to degeneration of the retinal ganglion cells and 95% of cases worldwide are due to point mutation. So single mutation where the color or sorry, the, that particular base that we were looking at has switched over into something else. So here, what these, uh, what the nomenclature here or the sort of naming of these mutations mean here is M is it's a mitochondrial DNA mutation. 11778 is the base pair location. If we counted all the individual bases at base pair number 11778, uh, the G has turned into an A. And here we can see that at 14484, T has turned to a C and so on and so forth. So each of these individual mutations can lead to mitochondrial dysfunction. So here we've got the mitochondrial DNA uh, hiding inside the mitochondria. And here we've got the retinal ganglion cells. So what we're looking at here is essentially a cross section of the back of the eyes or the retina. So if we look at this little section here on the right of the screen, and we look at this cross section, at the very back of the eyes, we've got the RPE and where the photoreceptors are. And photoreceptors, if you remember from school biology, is where the light is collected uh, at the back of the eyes. And that light energy is converted into an electrical energy, which is then transmitted to the brain along the optic nerve via the ganglion cells, which you can see here in blue. So here we've got the photoreceptors in black, green, and red and blue. And here, once that light energy is converted to an electrical energy, it gets passed along here into the cells which I've highlighted in red, and the tails of these cells or the axons of these cells essentially then feed back into the brain via the optic nerve. And so with labor hereditary optic neuropathy, these three mutations, which account for 95% of the cases worldwide, uh, essentially result in mitochondrial dysfunction only affecting the retinal ganglion cells. And so you can imagine if the retinal ganglion cells start to degenerate or they don't function as well as they should do, it doesn't matter that that light energy is converted to electrical energy, but if the electrical energy isn't able to be transmitted to the brain, essentially people with these particular disorders will start to lose their vision. So what does that look like? So someone with LHON typically will experience central scotoma or central blurring of their vision, which could potentially uh, lead into something that looks like this. So both eyes will be affected. The peak age of onset of people with LHON is between the ages of 15 and 35 years. And the vision loss is severe with rare or poor chance of recovery. Uh, and ultimately, visual acuity, so their ability to read the reading chart, is reduced to 660 or less, which, according to the RNIB, uh, meets their definition of legal blindness. So what does that mean? So in a standard optometry clinic chart, uh, the top letter on the chart is 660. So people with LHON typically either can only just see the top letter of the chart, or they can't see the chart at all, uh, and their vision is severely reduced. And so this impacts on the quality of life. You can imagine if you're between the ages of 15 and 35 and you developed you know, severe visual impairment uh, in, in the prime of your life, potentially it can lead to issues with occupation, with social relationships. Uh, for some people, they're not able to have a family. Uh, they're not able to drive. They're not able to enjoy social things. And so it can have uh, devastating effects uh, for individuals that are affected. So we thought about gene therapy for 
nuclear DNA and nuclear mutations, how about mitochondrial disorders? So although in theory we think, well, you know, why don't we package up something in the virus, send it to the nucleus, the nucleus then can produce a protein that replaces the defect that, you know, was uh, was was lost as a result of the mutation. For mitochondrial disorders, it's a little bit of a problem. And the reason for that, and it's illustrated very well on this diagram, is you can see here the nucleus in blue has little pores and things that allows the virus to enter. But the mitochondria has a double wall, which is relatively impervious, which means that the virus can't penetrate inside the mitochondria to leave the mitochondrial DNA inside there. Okay, So this requires some special thinking and some special design to gene therapy for mitochondrial diseases. And so the way that we get around it is using this technique called allotopic expression. So what's allotopic expression? Well, allotopic expression is very similar to conventional viral, uh, viral vector-based gene therapy, but instead of asking the mitochondria to produce the mitochondrial DNA, healthy mitochondrial DNA that was damaged, what we can do here is we can create a different version of the mitochondrial gene, the healthy version, and convert it into a nuclear-coded one. And then we can attach a sequence to it called a mitochondrial targeting sequence. We can then put this gene into the virus as we did before. We can then inject the virus into the eyeball and then the virus will then infect the retinal ganglion cells, as you can see here with these little gray, uh, gray shapes here, which is the virus entering the eye and infecting the retinal ganglion cell that we can see here. And the virus then enters the retinal ganglion cell. And like the gene therapy I spoke about before, the virus then enters the nucleus and then releases the DNA into the nucleus and using the ribosomes produces this protein sequence. And at the ends of the protein sequences are the mitochondrial targeting sequences, which are essentially like homing beacons that tell the protein where to go so that it ends up inside the mitochondria. So although I haven't indicated on this diagram here, the mitochondria have little pores or membrane complexes that allow certain things through them. And so if we can tag the protein that we've produced with a, a mitochondrial targeting sequence, uh, the mitochondria recognizes the protein as being okay to allow into the mitochondria. And as a result of that, the protein that's been produced then can attach to the complex that's been damaged. And in this example here, with gene therapy that we've produced for 11778 mutation, we basically replace the damaged complex one uh, that was damaged. Uh, and as a result, we can then recover the oxidative phosphorylation that was occurring and reduce some of the stress that's been put on the mitochondria. Okay, so this isn't just theoretical. Uh, we have been doing gene therapy for LHON for a couple of years now. Uh, the technique was, has been studied in several clinical trials, and here I've got a, a screenshot of a Daily Mail article, uh, I think from a couple of years ago, uh, with this young man who's got LHON, and while he was in the US, he was eligible to sign up for one of these clinical trials to test the medication. And uh, here you can see the quote from the article is that he, was, uh, he recovered his sight uh, and he's back to playing rugby again, uh, and that him and his family were astonished by the result, uh, and essentially he's now got very, very good vision uh, and no longer sees like the, the, the little diagram that I showed earlier. So there have been three clinical studies that have been performed to date, uh, all beginning with the letter R, Rescue Reverse, and the most recent one was called Reflect. Uh, Gensite Biologics is a French company that has developed and essentially 
is, is the owner of this particular gene therapy, which is specifically for people who carry the 11778 mutation. So we introduce a healthy copy of that particular gene, the ND4 gene, uh, into the eyes of people who have been affected by LHON, but the clinical study only includes individuals within the first 12 months of onset of vision loss. And so we can see here what this chart essentially shows is their visual, ab uh, visual ability uh, on the scale called a logma scale, uh, which is kind of a more technical version of the reading chart that you and I would potentially use in the opticians. And we can see compared to people who aren't treated in a natural history group, uh, there is a 16.5 uh, letter improvement. So in other words, they can read 16 and a half more letters than people who aren't able to read any letters at all and haven't been treated uh, um, as well. So there is a definite improvement uh, in vision in people who receive gene therapy uh, with this particular gene therapy product. So the question I guess that some of you have as well is allotopic expression. So this technique of harnessing the uh, nucleus of the cell is this technique, is this the solution for all mitochondrial diseases? And unfortunately, the answer to that is no. The first is in order to produce a gene therapy that utilizes allotopic expression, we will need to know what the genetic mutation is. And potentially, if we're going to develop a treatment, the treatment, unfortunately, will be very much uh, mutation specific because we're introducing a healthy copy of that gene uh, into the nucleus to produce a healthy protein. So you must know what the mutation is. And uh, in order to develop the treatment, you can't just inject any gene. It has to be the gene that's been affected by the mutation. And as I mentioned before, some of the genes are too big to be packaged into an AAV. So not all genetic disorders will uh, be appropriate for allotopic expression. And as I also mentioned before, it's also difficult to deliver AAV to all cells and have efficient transduction. So uh, some tissues such as, you know, the brain or the kidneys, it can be very difficult to inject or get the gene therapy product to the right area. Uh, but from a practical point of view, there's also lots of things that we also need to consider as well. So first of all, it's very expensive to develop a new drug and not many pharm pharmaceutical companies are interested in doing this, particularly if it's a mitochondrial dis disorder or a genetic disorder, which is rare, because as you can imagine, pharmaceutical companies won't make a lot of money uh, uh, for developing treatments for rare diseases. But more importantly, the process of developing new drugs takes a very long time. And not all drugs that have been developed in the preclinical phase make it to the clinical phase. And certainly not all drugs that make it to the clinical phase will make it to, uh, make it to, to, to market. So by that, I mean, even if a drug reaches human clinical trials and passes human clinical trials, there's no guarantee that health bodies or regulatory agencies such as NICE in the UK or the EMA in Europe or the FDA in the US will agree to fund the medication or even approve its use. So if we can't use allotopic expression for mitochondrial gene therapy, what are the other options that we have so one option is, well, if we can develop a mitochondrial targeting sequence that guides the protein to the mitochondria, why don't we attach the mitochondrial targeting sequence to the AAV? And actually, this study has been done. So it's only in the preclinical stage, but uh, in the US at Bascom Palmer uh, in Florida, the group there have essentially developed a module where they've attached a mitochondrial targeting sequence to the outside of the virus uh, the area called the AAV capsule, or the capsule. And so you can see that here in green. And so when the virus enters the cell, the green bit will essentially guide the virus to the mitochondria and uh, direct the AAV to deliver the healthy copy of the mitochondrial genome into the mito uh, sorry, healthy copy of the mitochondria into the uh, mitochondrial gene into the, into the mitochondria itself. Sorry, bit of a tongue twister there. Uh, and so finally, once the healthy copy of the gene is sent into the mitochondria, the mitochondria can then use it to create the normal protein that it should have produced. So this is still in preclinical stage. Uh, we've also got the technique of genome editing. 
So genome editing is this technique where we can essentially cut the, the DNA and then add different bits to it or cut the DNA and remove the bits that we don't want. And so this is a technique that was pioneered, uh, pioneered sorry, uh, in the last 10 years with newer uh, platforms or newer technology uh, that allows us to even edit individual bases within the, uh, within the DNA. And so a lot of these techniques were originally designed for nuclear DNA, so DNA in the nucleus, uh, but in the last couple of years, uh, the technology has now evolved to allow us to edit the genome within the mitochondria. Uh, and in Cambridge, the group, uh, several groups, I think, uh, in the mitochondrial biology unit, uh, the MBU, are looking at using technology uh, to correct uh, individual DNA mutations within the mitochondrial genome. The other technique that we can use, and this is quite an interesting one, is this idea called heteroplasmic shift. So if you remember earlier in the talk, I mentioned that even if the mitochondria are mutated, if the cell doesn't contain that many mutant load, the cell can still function. So one technique that's been considered, and it's still very much under investigation, is shifting heteroplasmy. So for example, if someone's mutant load within their cell, say for example, the muscle cells is sitting at 80 to 90%, and they've got muscle weakness and intolerance to exercise, if we can edit the mitochondrial genome or replace the mitochondrial uh, DNA with healthy ones, or eliminate the mutated ones, so repair, eliminate, or replace with healthy ones, potentially we can push down the proportion of unhealthy mitochondria, and as a result, push it down to below 80%, so that the cells, although there are still mutated mitochondria, uh, the cells can still function. So this is a technique called heteroplasmic shift. Um, but I think the one that I'm much more interested in and one that I think that we should be focusing more on is mutation non-specific therapies. So a lot of the treatments that I've just uh, outlined, so in addition to allotopic expression, they're all dependent on understanding and knowing the specific mutation that's causing disease uh, and repairing or replacing that specific mutation. Uh, here, with mutation nonspecific therapies, we want to try and uh, approach things from a different way. So if we know that mitochondrial dysfunction leads to the cell uh, not functioning well, and as a result, the kill switch being switched on, potentially we can interfere with that process by turning off the kill switch or preventing the kill switch from being switched on in the first place. So this is this idea of halting cell death or apoptosis. The other thing that we can do as well, if we know that very, very uh, dysfunctional mitochondria are producing a lot of reactive oxygen species that are essentially damaging the cell and destroying the different organelles within the cells, we can potentially uh, boost up uh, the functions of the cells that protect the cells from that damage. And so that's another approach as well. The other approach that we could, uh, can consider is increasing mitochondrial biogenesis. So if you remember from that diagram I showed very earlier on about the mitochondria splitting up and getting bigger, depending on the metabolic demands of the cell, potentially if we can augment the way that the mitochondria regulate those kinds of features, we can potentially increase the number of mitochondria. So even if they are a little bit damaged from dysfunctional mitochondrial DNA, there might still be enough mitochondria to keep the cell going. The last one, and this is where the controversy comes in, is if you remember right at the beginning, I said that mitochondrial DNA are inherited along the maternal lineage. In the UK, we have a technique called mitochondrial donation, and it's approved. It was first approved in 2015. Uh, the UK is the first country in the world to allow mitochondrial donation techniques within a regulatory environment. Uh, and it's, uh, it was first performed in Newcastle in their facility, a fertility centre, uh, with the first cases being approved in 2018. So what is mitochondrial donation uh, and why is it so controversial? So as most of you, hopefully all of you will know, uh, you know, the mother's egg is fertilized with the father's sperm in order to produce an embryo, which then uh, forms to become a baby. 
So within the mother's egg, which is a single cell, the mother's egg will have a nucleus which contains the mother's nuclear information, so half that information that will form the baby because the other half comes from the father's sperm, but the mother's egg also contains mitochondria as well. So in this example here, we're pretending that the mother carries a mitochondrial disease and she has unhealthy mitochondria. So the process of maternal spindle transfer essentially involves removing the mother's nucleus, which contains the uh, chromosomes that uh, contain you know, the information that will determine the characteristics of that child, remove the nucleus, and then at the same time, using fertility techniques, we can take a donor's egg remove the donor's nucleus, which therefore no longer contains any information about the donor, and all we're left with is an egg with healthy mitochondria. We can then transplant the nucleus into the healthy donor uh, egg and then fertilize it with the father's sperm to produce a baby that no longer carries mitochondrial uh, mutation. So this is called maternal spindle transfer. The more controversial version of this is called pronuclear transfer, and both techniques are offered in the UK. With pronuclear transfer, here we've got the patient, the mother again, who has unhealthy mitochondria from her mitochondrial disease. And we've also got the donor with healthy mitochondria, and this little sort of uh, rugby ball with a line in the middle represents the uh, I think, nucleus and the chromosomes there. But in this example, pro-nuclear transfer, instead of just fertilizing the uh, mother's egg with the father's sperm, we fertilize both the mother's egg and the donor's egg with the father's sperm to produce two fertilized eggs, one containing nuclear DNA uh, from the egg and sperm and, and this thing called a pronuclei. Uh, and so the egg on the mother's egg will have, uh, you know, the first, well, sorry, the fertilized egg uh, from, the mother's, uh, from the mother's side will have the unhealthy mitochondria and in the healthy donor, we've got healthy mitochondria. But essentially in this process here, we then remove the pronuclei from the unhealthy fertilized egg uh, remove also the donor nuclear DNA and then essentially transplant the nuclear DNA uh, from the fertilized egg uh, obtained from the mother and the fertilized egg obtained uh, from the donor as well. So the key difference here between these two uh, processes is where you perform the fertilization. But the net result is that you have a fertilized egg containing the mother and the father's nuclear DNA uh, and has no nuclear DNA from the donor. Uh, but then at the same time, you've got healthy nuclear, sorry, healthy mitochondrial DNA uh, from the donor. And as a result, the offspring that's produced, the child that's produced, no longer has the uh, unhealthy mitochondria and therefore is at no risk of, uh, of passing it down if they're female themselves. Because if this child was female, they'll pass down the healthy mitochondria that had been uh, obtained from the donor. So in conclusion, um, you know, there is a rapid pace, sorry, the rapid pace of technological advancements in gene therapy and genome editing techniques means that there's a lot of opportunities for developing treatments for mitochondrial diseases. And although we know that the process is really long and costly, uh, a lot of the treatments really are focused currently on uh, specific genetic mutations. And I think from a patient perspective, I think it's much better to be focusing on treatments that aren't mutation specific, because potentially if we develop a treatment that's not mutation specific, we can offer it to everyone irrespective of their specific mutation. Uh, and lastly, we should also consider treatment options that halt the transmission of mitochondrial diseases. Uh, and although these are controversial, uh, and for some individuals it might be ethically or socially unacceptable, uh, the current gene therapy techniques that we use to correct and repair uh, or replace mitochondrial diseases don't alter uh, the transmission of the disease. So really, in order to stop mitochondrial diseases from being passed on, uh, we really should consider um, these fertility uh, treatments as well. And I'll end there.